Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and welcome to the latest of EICC's Innovation Nation series of free public talks uh, entitled Innovation Books this evening. Uh, Innovation Nation is an EICC-led initiative uh, to celebrate all things innovative in Scotland, from engineering to science to culture, the arts, and many other areas of interest. And tonight, we are very fortunate to have two fantastic speakers, uh, Lynn Anderson and Gordon Brown, who are going to talk to us about the unique place that Scottish crime uh, writing holds on the world stage and why they feel it's become so successful. Both Lynn and Gordon join uh, a long and impressive list of speakers to have addressed uh, Innovation Nation audiences over the last few years on subjects ranging from bridge design, uh, robotics, architecture, and human endurance. As a venue that sees innovation as one of its own key values, we're delighted uh, that you've all come along tonight for, for what we hope will be, we know will be a fascinating evening. Um, there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions at the end of the talks uh, when roving microphones will be doing the rounds. And if I could just ask that um, you wait until the microphone comes before you ask your question, because we are filming this evening also. So, ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to Lynn Anderson and Gordon Brown. Thank you. Evening, everybody. Um, my name's Gordon Brown. For those that thought the ex-Prime Minister was coming along, yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. I've spent my life wondering why I should, maybe I should change my name. And actually, just a bit of information, I've just handed a new book to my agent, and the first thing he came back to me, he says, would you consider changing your name to the new book? And I went, yeah, I will. <laughs> So, uh, as I said, my name's Gordon Brown. Uh, I'm an author. I have six uh, novels out, three in a crime thriller series, uh, three in a thriller series and three in a crime series here in the US. I'm also one of the founding directors of Bloody Scotland, and I also, uh, I've got a marketing background. <laughs> okay. Introduce. Thank you. Uh, my name's Lynn Anderson. Is, have I met anyone here before? No? You Oh, thank you very much. I, I was trying to watch you secretly as you come in the door, just in case you were someone I'd already met. Anyway, my name's Lynn Anderson, and um, I'm a crime writer in Scotland. Uh, I have a series starring uh, a Dr. Rona McLeod, who's a forensic scientist. Um, that I'm just currently working on book 14 of that series, so it's a long-running series. The first one came out 15 years ago. Um, the beginning of the Rhone Cloud. I also do another series set in the south of France. Uh, that's sort of easier, yeah. If you go and do the research there, maybe a little bit sunnier. Um, I am a co-founder of Bloody Scotland, together with Alex Gray and, uh, and, and Gordon. And uh, we, we're loving the whole, um, the whole idea of, of really giving Scottish crime writing to the world, which is what we're all about. So what we're going to do is we're going to chat tonight on Scottish crime writing. We're going to talk about Scottish crime writing, maybe where it came from, why it's so big. We've tried to, to answer that question, and we'll be the first to have ever done it if we do it tonight. <laughs> yeah, we will. On top of that, um, why it's so big where it is at the moment. And we're also going to dip into Bloody Scotland. We're going to talk about the Crime Writing Festival because it's very relevant to what's going on with Scottish crime. We're also very, very aware of how important Scottish crime is uh, in terms of Scottish crime writing. The reason that quote's up there uh, from James Kelman was he got so annoyed by Scottish crime writing one day we caught him saying this. <laughs> so from our point of view, we thought it's quite an appropriate thing to say when, when you look at crime writing overall. And then we're going to look at the lessons. Are there any lessons we could take from what we've done, what we've read, what we've seen and how we've set up Bloody Scotland that might be useful just, just general in, in general? So just going to kick off with something to start with. Just as a question, but in general, what have these things got in common? You know, Dolly the Sheep, uh, Rockstar, the uh, digital games agency, Bovril, the dugout, I never knew this, but the dugout, the football dugout, Boys Brigade, Tires, the Beano, Bloody Scotland. <laughs> Sorry. It is, spot on. 
Every, all of them, yes. We haven't got any sweeties or prizes for questions. Sorry, or we would have. Might have some books later on. But all of them have got Scots at heart. And the reason I put that up is, the interesting thing for me is we, we are regularly asked uh, that question of why is Scottish crime writing so successful? When I was at university, one of the marketing lecturers, I asked the question, why have we done all that? Why are there so many Scots around the world that have done that? And his answer was quite simple, which is the Scots tend to take what they know and look outward. They don't look inward. They tend to take it out and they tend to, to take it to other countries and other places. And when I'm asked the question, why is Scottish crime writing so important or why does it do so well? My answer is, why not? But I think some people out there think there's some Machiavellian plot that Scottish crime writing isn't actually that good and we pretended it is for years. <laughs> in the, and it's not, from our point of view, that the, the, the answer's quite simple, is we're good at what we do. We are. Um, and it shouldn't really be a surprise that it's so widely read. Um, and we have a quote from Gillian Plain, a professor at the School of English at St Andrews University, and you'll see it on the, uh, on the screen there. So this is the... the from the literati, there's a, a wonderful quote about the duality in Scotland, and we're going to look a bit about that. Uh, respectable people, now you come from Edinburgh, so you know all about respectability, you know, what did we used to see from the West? Uh, fur coat and knee knickers. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a West Coaster, sorry, although I live in Edinburgh. Respectable people harbouring deep, dark secrets and this wonderful mix of truth and justice, but with a vein of criminality. Um, if you ask many of the crime writers in Scotland, people like um, Ian Rankin and Val McDermott and Chris Brookmeyer, they'll often say, talk to you about Robert Louis Stevenson. And I would do the same. He was a huge influence on me as a storyteller. Uh, the strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, the, the copy I have of it is 90, minute, 90 minutes, 90 pages long. Is that not astonishing? It, in that 90 pages, what is achieved in that story, where it, it really looks at the, I mean, you could call it a horror, you could call it a detective, you could call it a mystery, you could call it a sci-fi uh, in 90 pages. And it ha it's had an enormous influence, uh, I think, on Scottish crime writing. You add in, of course, James Hogg's private memoirs and confessions of a justified sinner. You'll find that Ian talks about that novel, as does Val, as does many of the other, our other crime writers. Burke and Hare, well, you're all responsible. Edinburgh is responsible for Burke and Hare. And Sherlock Holmes, too, adds to, although Arthur Conan Doyle is... Um, a lot of his ideas come from it being in Edinburgh, uh, he just switched the locations uh, to, to London. But the truth is that up until the late 60s, there is no real tradition of crime writing in Scotland. Uh, you had the golden age of crime south of the border um, prior to that. All, we loved them all. I mean, I, I think I've read every single Agatha Christie more than once. And a lot of authors from south of the border were our reading material. Until, of course, an author called William McIlvanny turned his attention to writing crime. A few years ago, there's a great interest in Scottish crime writing in Europe. In fact, you'll find it's probably easier for Scottish crime writers earlier in their career to be published in Europe than it is to find their books on tables south of the border. And I, went, I was asked at a conference at Gutenheim in Germany to uh, give uh, a lecture on, on crime writing in Scotland. Uh, prior to that, I sat and listened to a number of uh, scholars at the university who had written papers on Scottish crime writing. And they'd written about Ian Rankin's Rebus, they'd written about Val McDermott, they'd written about Chris Brookmeyer. And all I could think about in the audience was, where was Willie? Uh, you know, I, I couldn't believe it because none of them seemed to know about Willie McIlvanny. And yet every one of the people that they were discussing in their, in their academic papers would have immediately spoken about, about Willie McIlvanny. 
and the Laid Law Trilogy. It's looked on by many crime writers as the genesis of the genre. Uh, Ian Rankin, whose Reba series took, us, took her writing to the world, and uh, he was, he may well still be, the biggest selling crime writer in the UK. He frequently pays tribute to Detective Inspector Jack Laidlaw as his inspiration for the character of Rebus. And when we first meet Mac O'Vanny's Glasgow-based detective, it is very easy to see why. I'll let you have a look at what's on the screen. Lynn and I were privileged to know Willie. Um, I don't know if it, has anyone read the Lady Law trilogy in here. Yeah, if, if you I, haven't, if you haven't, you should. If you, if you like your crime fiction, you should absolutely go out and get the Laid Law trilogy. It it makes you cry how well written it is. And the <laughs> yeah. thing about Willie was when Willie died, Willie passed away in 2015. The festival we were involved with used to run the Scottish Crime Book of the Year, and we unanimously decided that we we're going to change the name to the McIlvany Award in tribute to to, to, to Willie. Because, as Lynn said, it wasn't that long ago that Willie's books weren't that well known, and they're still probably not as well known as they should be. And yet, if you talk to most Scottish crime writers, they will cite uh, Willie as being inspiration to what they did. And, and somebody who, if you'd met Willie, was a lovely man. He was supremely intelligent, extremely humorous, but he was always a bit bemused at his own status within the writers. I'll give you an example. Willie was a, a teacher in Kilmarnock for many years at a secondary school in Kilmarnock. And he'd won a lot of literary awards before he turned his hand to crime fiction. And when he did, one of his English teachers at the school turned to him in the pub one day and said to him, why are you writing something as worthless as a detective novel? <laughs> and Willie's answer was superb. Willie said to him, he said, the old assumed automatic distinction between detective stories and literature tends to serve as a way for people whose reading habits have petrified to protect themselves from having to think afresh. I love that. <laughs> Willie's view was that crime writing was as valid as anything else that was out there and there was no reason why it shouldn't be. But even to this day, there still is a problem. If you go and talk to people about literary fiction and contemporary fiction, you'll find crime writers feel that they've been put to one side. The Booker Prize very rarely until recently had anything in it at all, although that's changing. Graham McRae Burnett's His Bloody Scotland was shortlisted His two years project. ago. His Bloody Project. We've not claimed it entirely. <laughs> Wait till Graham sees this in the video. He'll say, I'm <laughs> he changed the name of my book. And also, Val McDermott was one of the judges last year. Yeah, and just an adage to that, I mean, at Bloody Scotland, we promote your writing uh, through a variety of methods. Uh, but one of them is for people's first novel. Uh, we ask a selection of them to come and stand and talk about their book for three minutes at the Albert Hall, 700 people filled Albert Hall before a major act. So we had in fact, before Graham was shortlisted, we had asked him to be one of our spotlighters. So he stood up and read three minutes of his bloody project before Ian Rankin's event. And then what Ian did was, he said, well, if you're coming to buy a book and have it signed by me at the end of this event, you better have one of his as well. <laughs> so <laughs> Graham, Graham got a really good, uh, good gig there. Now, Ian often claims, and I think it's true not to be influenced, uh, really much by the English crime novel. Um, he said, and I quote him, I've never read any Agatha Christie, unlike me, uh, Marjorie Allingham, Dorothy L. Sears, but I read a lot of Muriel Spark, which is very dark. And I'd read William McIlvany and James Kelman, who we <laughs> obviously gave a hard to time at the beginning, Alistair Gray, and John Buchan, which I love too, and Alistair MacLean, that I really enjoyed. So when he created Rebus in Knots and Crosses, the very first of the Rebus series, to his mind, it was a contemporary retelling of Stevenson's Jekyll and Hyde. Now, I bet anybody who's a Rebus fan didn't know that. Did anybody know that? 
No. Was Reba set up as a possible murderer? But much to his chagrin, nobody noticed that. It's, he talks about, he openly admits about going into bookshops and switching knots and crosses from the crime section to the section on Scottish literary fiction. <laughs> Next to, guess who? Mac O'Vanny, suggesting, that suggests that Ian, he was actually supposed to be working on his PhD at the t on Muriel Spark at the time that this all happened, but he didn't necessarily regard himself as a crime writer. He often also talks about the border ballads as being a sort of influence in him. And for those of you who are familiar with the border ballads, sung or otherwise, they are traditional songs of murder and mayhem on the border between Scotland and England. But in Scottish crime writing, there is no particular equivalent of Agatha Christie or, in fact, Raymond Chandler in the USA. What's fascinating, we, we know of, of um, Ian being this really, really big star now. But Knots and Crosses was first published in 1987 and there was no rush to buy the book. Uh, it took 10 years uh, until the eighth book, Black and Blue, came out. I remember hearing him talking about the fact that he thought his publisher was actually about to drop him. Uh, when Black and Blue came out, and he won real commercial success with Black and Blue, and in fact won the Crime Association, Crime Writers Association Gold Dagger for the best uh, crime novel of the year. So the kind of rocks of Scottish crime fiction, uh, the original one is Laidlaw, is um, Willie with Laidlaw, but then we were followed on from him with Val McDermott and with uh, Ian Rankin. After which, of course, we got Denise Miner, Stuart McBride, Chris Brookmeyer, and the two major characters, Ian and Val, they both celebrated 30 year anniversaries last year. And at the beginning of Bloody Scotland, we have a torchlit parade that comes down from the castle to the Albert Hall for the opening night. It's, it's an astonishing thing to watch. And of course, they led the procession uh, to the Albert Hall. And there goes, from our point of view, one of the things that's interesting, if you think that Ian actually hit the shelves maybe 20 years ago with something that started selling, the act, Scottish crime writing, as it currently is, isn't that old. It's not got a huge hit yet. If we go abroad, people talk, you know, especially when you go to different countries in the States, they talk about Tartan Noir and Scottish crime writing as if it's been around for a long, long period of time. And the truth is it hasn't. And to give you some idea of how much it's grown, the festival that we run, Bloody Scotland, when we do the annual McIlvany Award, we ask for novels to be submitted. And the rule is they have to be written by a Scot or set in Scotland. That's the rule. And this year alone, we had 72 that came in, and that's just a fraction of the number of novels that are out there, compared to what was very, very few 20 years ago. And on top of that, we also had, as, as Lynn mentioned, we had something like 13 debut authors who all got a chance to read from their first book. And when we started this initiative at the festival, we were struggling to find authors to stand up and read from their debut novel. Now we have a queue of people who are writing. And at the moment, you've, we've never seen so many new authors step onto the stage from a Scottish point of view. And the reason for that is present day Scottish crime writing challenges title, tradition, status. And I asked a question that Willie McIlvany asked. And one of the reasons when we start to talk about the number of five Scottish crime writing, Willie used to talk about when you're writing, who is the true monster amongst us? What was the real interest? As opposed to in the olden days, because if you think about it, the old classic novels, the Sherlock Holmes and the Hercule Poirots of this world, and I'd put my money on Rebus any day of the week in terms of, in, in, from that chart point of view. But when you think back how that used to work, it used to be the detective was quite dumb. He might be the stupidest person in the book, yeah? He required someone from the upper classes to ride in and save him, yeah? And it never challenged why society was like that. But you then get to Willie McIlvany and you get to Rebus. And their detectives are down to earth. They're of, uh, every day out there, but they're erudite, they're intelligent. They're, they're, they're challenging and they're talking about what is going on in society. 
Another award-winning you mentioned it earlier is Denise Maina. Her first series, Garnet Hill, which is now a trilogy, well, a trilogy, is 20 years old. Denise's main character is a girl called Maureen O'Donnell. Now, Maureen O'Donnell was a psychiatric patient who'd been sexually abused. And, but it was her, she challenged the assumptions in the book about mental health, illness, class, sexism. And she started to challenge who the real monsters are. So you start to get a sense of that we're writing in a different way, that Scottish writing is in a different way, but that still doesn't quite answer why Scottish crime writing is different. Yeah, and because we're asked this quite often and you have to really sort of try and put down your thoughts, I mean, it is a dominant force in Scottish literary life, without a doubt. It sells the most books, it's borrowed most frequently from libraries, and it, has, it is internationally renowned. Despite the breadth of its church, the diversity of its subgenres, its styles, its settings, its themes, its politics, its aesthetics, its voices, it seems to have a recognisable quality and a shared concern. Louise Welsh, one of Scotland's most successful authors and a professor of creative writing at Glasgow University, when asked what it is about Scotland that breeds good crime fiction, she said, and there it is. <laughs> and tonight, really, I mean, a murder should happen tonight. And <laughs> you should be writing one tonight, <laughs> seriously, all of you. We're not planning to murder anybody off. Well, not yet, anyway. Um, Gordon. But the truth is, if there was a formula, if Scottish crime writing had a formula, we'd be able to say to everybody, there it is, go and do it. Yet there would be people churning it out, and yet the books aren't the same. The interesting bit for me is that people ask that question, what's the formula? But Somerset Mon said this many, many years ago. There are three rules for writing the novel. Unfortunately, no one knows what they are. And that's the issue, is it's, very, it's quite hard to pin down what it is that makes a Scottish crime book a Scottish crime book. To give you an idea of how big it is, in Waterstones in Scotland, one in four of every single book that walks out of Waterstones is now a crime book. So for every person you walk out, there's a deviant and then there's three that aren't. Oh, that's the wrong way around. <laughs> if you click on Amazon, right, so if you go and click on Amazon, right, you'll find that there's now 42 sub-genres of mystery, thriller and crime. Yeah, that's how many different variations there are. And if you're not convinced yet about the breadth of crime and how, how broad it's become, if you go to the States, they have sub-sub-genres. They would have to. It's the US, yes. And they have things like, and I'm looking around to see if anyone's read any of these, cat detective novels. <laughs> where the cat solves the mystery. And if you think this is a small niche, you're completely wrong. I know one author who sells hundreds of thousands of cat books. And this also proves something else. Crime, crime readers are very passionate. And the reason I know they're passionate is she decided one time she was going to put a dog in to help the cat solve the crime, yes? And she got lots of hate letters from her readers. <laughs> Yeah, and if you ever get the chance to go to one of these big crime uh, festivals in America, it's, it, it really is, yeah, it does your head in. Uh, <laughs> it does. Because, <laughs> it does your head in. But I noticed that the other one they have is they have crime novels that are, have got food, food in the oh. title. The macaroni cheese mystery. Uh, the, I keep thinking of it like steak pie. I, I keep thinking about Scottish food, but, they, you know, it's Me not like that food. over there. Um, OK, we don't go in for cats, except I should tell you, and you probably know this already, dare to kill an animal in a crime novel. You can kill as many people in Scotland as you like, but I'm still getting grief because in the second of the Rona series, there was a dog down in Princess Street that somebody hit over hit its nose with an iron bar. Can I point out, the dog did not die. You know, its owner died, but nobody was worried about her. But anyway, but we have crime writers covering the widest range. And um, I mentioned I write Rona McLeod, a forensic scientist. Gordon writes about Craig McIntyre, a man with an almost supernatural ability. And uh, Chris Brookmeyer, 
uh, was shortlisted in this year's McIlvany Prize with a crime book set in space. Now, I'll, I'll give you the final shortlist. Do you see what I'm talking about? But the breadth of writing. The winner was Liam McIlvany, Willie McIlvany's son, who lives and teaches at university in New Zealand. And he won with a book set in the 60s about Bible John Glasgow called The Quaker. The others in the shortlist were Chris with Place in Darkness, which was on a spaceship. Um, there was a spy novel by Charles Cummings called The Man Between. Uh, and my book was on the shortlist to Follow the Dead, which is, opens in the top of Cairngorm Mountain at Hogmanay in a blizzard. What could possibly go wrong? and moves between Scotland and Norway. I think that's a perfect example of the breadth of writing. There is no formula anywhere in there, and yet they're all recognisable as Scottish crime novels when you read them. Uh, so the sort of three uh, key words that keep coming up about uh, Scottish crime, it's fame, the aspect of its mystery, and that wonderful Scottish word, thrawn. Uh, I can remember when I gave the paper in, uh, over in the French university, oh, they completely love this aspect of, of, of the Scots being thrown. And I suggested in the paper that the common thread is a healthy disregard for those in power. And do we not need that at the moment? and a predisposition to be thrown. So what does thrown mean? Well, you'll all have your own version of it, I'm sure. But I would say it means if Scots are told what to do or what to think, I keep thinking of my teenage children now, you know, they'll go for the exact opposite. Uh, we're perverse and bloody-minded and will always question the status quo. We could also argue that the beauty and mystery and the dark history of Scotland provides a perfect canvas to write on. As I mentioned earlier, the impact Scots have had in the world and the country's underlying fame makes it simple for people to place our writing in an easy, in an easy way to understand geographical and the social context of the story. But in the spirit of trying to come up with something that hadn't been written before, we turned to that wonderful world of social media. So me and Lynn, a couple of weeks ago, decided to ask the readers, which is not always the best idea in the world, but we decided to ask the readers, why was Scottish crime fiction so successful? On Twitter. On Twitter. And we got inundated. Inundated. <laughs> with people coming back to say what they thought it was. So to put it together, what I did was we took everything, we stuck it into, you know, word clouds, how word clouds work? So we put it in a word cloud and we put all the words that came out of it into this, into a word cloud to see what came out. And there's something quite interesting happened and we did have an awful lot of replies. The three main words that come up time and time and time again about Scottish crime writing are dark, sense of humour and Scottish. And consistently when you ask people what makes Scottish crime writing different, they will talk about those three things. Now we know you can go to other countries like Scandinavian for Scandi noir, but it kind of lacks humour. If you go outside of Scotland, the Scotland, the place doesn't exist. And for some people, if you go to the States with cosy crime, there is no darkness. And then when you apply this and you look at Scottish crime books, you begin to realise there is a common thread that, that runs across it. If we love the dark, we, we as a nation, we talked about this laughingly, but coming in tonight and it's dark, yeah? But it is a great time to write, because if there's nothing else to do, it's good for the authors to sit down and do something. Otherwise, they'd be on the streets. So you're lucky they're actually sitting writing. But if you take somebody like Denise Miner, Denise said the following. She was asked the question, why are we interested? Well, we're interested in why someone did the crime, yeah? We're not actually that bothered about who did it. Yeah, we kind of like the idea of what, and I think she says that's interesting because in her view, we're attracted to the why people are deviant. We quite like that. We like writing about it and we like reading about it. And that makes for very good dark stories. But 
if they were all that dark, you would never read them. They need some humour in there. And it's interesting when you ask about humour. And for humour, I turn to, do people know Chris Brookmeyer? Christopher Brookmeyer, right? Chris's first book, Ugly One Morning, has a classic opening scene. If you've not read it, you ought to read it. And if you ever wondered how humour plays into a detective story, I'm going to read you a paragraph from it. And it's when the detective first stumbles upon the crime scene. The varied bouquet of smells was a delightful courtesy detail. From the overture of fresh vomit whiff that greeted you at the foot of the closed stairs, through the mustique of barely cold urine on the landing, to the tear gas, fist in the face, guard dog of guff that savaged anyone entering the flat, it just told you how much fun this case was going to be. <laughs> now tell me that hasn't got darkness and humour and Scottishness all written through all it. All written into one. That's all written true. into one place. Oh. But on top of that, readers adore Scotland. Yeah. Uh, we as a nation of writers, um, Scotland tends not to celebrate or didn't this wonderful achievement of the writers. It always struck me as uh, odd. We had the most famous uh, writer in the UK, the biggest best-selling author was from Scotland. And we had this whole wonderful, we were aware of Willie McIlvany, we were aware of all our other authors. And yet somehow we weren't telling the world about that. And what happened was, Alex Gray and myself were down in York at a Crime Writers Association conference. And we were sitting after the dinner, and it's, the story is now one of legend, but we were on the second bottle of Prosecco, I have to say. And we're looking about thinking, why on earth are we always down here? And when we looked about at the people who were taking part, and a very large proportion of them, certainly more than 10%, were from Scotland. And it was that wonderful moment of innovation when you think, but why haven't we got the festival and people come to us? Um, and I don't, it was actually Bloody Scotland was coined by Alex Gray. And because it ends up being in Stirling, uh, we'll talk a bit about how that happened. It, it's, it's, a, it's a brilliant name, but it's also got humour because when you say to people, when you say, I'm going to bloody Scotland, people think, you know, she's being not nice about Scotland. And when we had our first launch in London a few years back at the Piccadillys, the Watersons Piccadillys, I actually have to tell you it was in 2014. So this is August 2014, and I went up to the desk to try and find out where the launch was, where the room was. It's a huge place, that Watersons Piccadilly. And I said to the nice young lady behind the counter, I said, I'm looking for bloody Scotland. And she went, are we allowed to say that? <laughs> And I remember that Alex Gray saying to me after she came up with the name, I want, I want people, when you say to them, where are you going to be in September? They're going to say to me, I'm going to be in blood, at bloody Scotland. And I think it was a wonderful, a wonderful name. And we, we had a, a sort of byline to it. We thought it would be, we would call it a criminally good weekend. And we never actually used that but it's exactly what we live by. And I think you're going to see a little clip now to give you a flavour. So if you haven't been, you'll want to go after this. The weekend of crime, murder and mayhem that we all look forward to as Stirling's bloody Scotland reveals itself. There's something special to me about Scottish crime fiction because it has an immediacy. The winner of the 2018 McElvinny Prize is The Quaker by Leah McElvinny. <laughs> Thanks for
should read it. I want people to read it and feel a wee bit dirty. <laughs> I'm happy to be called a crime writer. Yeah. I, don't, I don't want to put anybody off. Yeah. I don't want any... No, serious, I don't want anybody out there thinking, oh, those books are not for the likes of me. Yeah. I want everybody to think those books are definitely for the likes of me. Their job's to work with you to make it the best book it can be and the book that you dream of writing. And you still publish it and you still think, that was a pile of shite. <laughs> This is my opinion, but is this the place to say that? Are you shoving that down people's throats? Should you maybe just shut up? Do artists have the right to talk about everything? Everyone having a lot of fun, yeah. It was, uh, yeah, it seems very friendly and uh, <laughs> belies its name, shall we say. At least I haven't seen any dead bodies yet. Um, yeah, I think sometimes people just deserve it. Um, and if, if we had another half hour, I'd give you a list, but... <laughs> Whatever you write, um, it's as empowering as reading. If, you know, if you read, you live a thousands of lives. You have to understand that if you're lucky enough to be chosen for this, to work for this organisation, you'll never be able to tell anybody what you do. You will have no public recognition for your successes. And I thought, ah, you know, this isn't for me. You know, and look at us, we're both in, in, in television. <laughs> we're too vain for this. <laughs> Ponderosa Metalworks, not 15 yards from this theater. <laughs> Do you want a curry after you have finished? <laughs> and it was all those kind of things. And, and, and in a way, that's, that's what these things are. You know, there, there, there's the dedication, there's the acknowledgement. He, here's that first title page. Coaster ride, it was more of a ghost train for us because you go in the ghost train, you want to be a bit grossed out, you want uh, to be scared, you want to be on rapid twists and turns, but you also want to have a good time. The reason we're showing you that is that the birth of bloody Scotland, when it started off, we reflected in the same way that authors would tend to write a book. If we think about the journey we went through to bring it, and we think it's quite important as a festival, because what we think is we are now helping to take Scotland even further to other parts of the world. We are encouraging people to read Scottish crime writing, but we're not just about Scottish crime writing. One story I need to tell you is Val McDermott, when she was in the crime love, crime love and fun, uh, I can't say it right now. <laughs> the Fun Loving Crime Writers, which is the band, I had to do it. my job, I'm one of the board members, my job doing the band's rider. I'm the one that had to go and get the drinks and eventually went for Val's, Val's drink and I brought this huge glass of wine. 
And I said to Val, I didn't know whether you wanted a small glass of wine or a large glass of wine. And Val says in an inimitable style, do I look like the sort of lady that would want a small glass of wine? <laughs> but if you think about it, we, we tended to approach Bloody Scotland the way we do writing. We're authors, there's four authors on the board. We, we, we needed a core idea, this idea of there's never been a festival for Scotland. It had to have some uniqueness about it. We needed a killer name. We needed a title, Bloody Scotland. We had no idea what the finished event would look like. Absolutely none. We changed our minds on format. We changed our minds on where it was going to be located. We changed our minds loads of times over that. We need help with other people. We needed other people that knew what they were doing to come and help us. And we also, every year when we finish, we start again. It's the same with writing. When you finish one book, you're almost straight on to the next one. And it's worked. We shifted just under 10,000 tickets this year. Uh, we had over 100 authors in Stirling. And here's a lesson we learned along the way. Copying what everybody else does doesn't work. In the same way that we approach Scottish crime writing, we approached it very differently in terms of what we do at Bloody Scotland. What we decided was it was not just going to be an event with people talking about books for the entire weekend. That's why we've got people kicking a ball. England versus Scottish writers in Scotland better do better next year. Um, we've got Crime in the Spotlight, as Lynn mentioned. We're giving debut authors the chance to, to stand up and read their work for the first time. Or the Torchlit Parade. You should have seen how nervous Stirling Council were about letting 500 right readers walk down with lit torches into the middle of Stirling. They've had bad examples in Stirling in the past of that. <laughs> Yeah, it, it took, it's remarkable really, this is our seventh year, but the idea happened three years before that. But the important thing is, whenever we voiced that idea, lights went on in faces. And always the thought was, why did we not think of it before? It's that wonderful moment, it's a bit like the beginning of a book, you know, suddenly there's an idea that just booms in your head. And we were very lucky because when we approached the rocks of Scottish crime writing, everybody said, we'll come. So we already had a big lineup before we added anyone else in, which is obviously really important. We also work very closely with Stirling, uh, the council in Stirling. Um, and initially we actually piggybacked onto uh, their off the page library sort of weeks event where they were having they were having events and authors into libraries and the advice came from Val McDermott to do that now Val was instrumental in setting up Harrogate the chair of bloody Scotland is Jenny Brown I'm sure you'll know her name she's my agent as well but she was instrumental in setting up Edinburgh International Book Festival and forgetting um, the city of literature for Edinburgh. So she has, she has the enthusiasm and the determination. And to get something off the ground like this, it took three years. But by the time the first year happened, people uh, were thinking, has this happened before? Because the planning and the thought uh, and the process took three years before we actually, we were just listening earlier to Dubai has been built in four. I know. <laughs> took us three to build Bloody Scotland. We are a charity uh, and we don't, we don't make a profit as such, but when you see the figures back for Stirling Council, the impact that it, made, it makes locally, it's just astonishing uh, what it's done uh, for Stirling. We're very involved also with the schools and young people. And I should just say this at, one, at this point, that incredible logo was designed by students at the local college. And we went into them before Bloody Scotland began, uh, Craig Robertson and I, and we spoke to their media uh, and their sort of computing and design students. And these, we asked them if they could come up with a logo and there were six groups, and one of the groups, when we saw it, now isn't that is such a simple logo, and yet the power of it is the brand of it. In fact, we're we're struggling with people trying to pinch our brand now. But the aim was threefold, 
as we said before, to, well, really to just put it out to the world that we were in this business of crime writing, but also to develop new writers and to give a platform to writers who we knew, but the world didn't know yet, and to invite the world to visit us uh, in Scotland. So to put Scotland to the world and to bring the world to Scotland, that was our aim. We also tie up, we have outreach programmes in Scotland as well, because, you know, it's not all that easy for everybody to get to Stirling. So you'll have noticed lots of other things have sprung up. Granite Noir, Butte Noir. Um, we encourage and do what we can to help small communities in outlying places in Scotland um, to feature um, their, own, their own particular brand of Scottish crime writing so that local people can go to it. We've been to Kolkata two years now. Um, to, it's a huge festival, literary festival in, uh, in India. It has an astonishing book. <laughs> The sale of books, they get something like three million people. <laughs> you can hardly believe it, not at the festival itself, but go there to buy books. And I, I remember being, they set up all these tents and these tents are full of books. And I remember going into the tent, I was there the first year, Bloody Scotland did a panel uh, uh, at Kolkata. And there was a little boy and he was buying a book and you could hardly move in the tent, there were so many people. And he went up to the, the English uh, books, the books in English, and he chose this book. It was obviously, it looked like a classic. And, and, and he came back uh, to pay for it. And I was interested to see what book he had bought. He would be about 10, 10, 11. Uh, and he bought a book by a very famous uh, author of Scotland, Sir Walter Scott, Ivanhoe. I did think to myself at the time, my God, you couldn't get a 10-year-old to read that in Scotland. Uh, but the desire for books uh, and, and Scotland having a place there was obvious. We're, we've also been out just recently, Gordon and I, to Javier, uh, Javier Negra in Spain, um, where we did a, a panel. Uh, they have an arts festival there, and it, it was mobbed. Yeah. It, was, it, it was mobbed. And we go to, across to the States where individual authors go out, but essentially they go to represent Bloody Scotland um, in left coast crime in America, which it changes its location year by year. And our aim is we are ambassadors, we are out there, we are promoting, we are bloody Scotland folk. In fact, tonight I was asked if I could perhaps take off my scarf when I, or was that a fashion disaster? And I used to get on the microphone and I said, I couldn't possibly take off my scarf because I'm talking about tartan noir. I mean, you've got to at least have a bit of tartan on there about that. But the idea is Scotland to the world as Jenny Brown said, that is our aim. It's not all one-way traffic, of course. We're not built on exclusivity, as, uh, as was said earlier. It's inclusivity. Um, this year, a very particular year, uh, because it is the last one before Brexit, in September of this year, we invited four people from writers from 14 different countries to bloody Scotland, just in case we couldn't get them here <laughs> next year. Um, we had USA, Iceland, Germany, Spain, Italy, New Zealand, and we even asked people from south of the border. So we're always fair. Why do we do that? Because it's what festival goers want. And if you're, and I believe you will be readers, it's wonderful to find out about books that you didn't know existed. And to enter, look at the way we've all adopted Scandi crime when, you know, it's not that many years ago we knew nothing about it. Uh, and we've loved it. They love their Scottish crime fiction 
but they're not, we're not inward looking. What I would say is our audience for Scottish crime fiction is enormous and they love the core of it, the festival, to be distinctly quirky and Scottish. The one thing came to me when I was watching that, we have a quiz and Craig Robertson runs the quiz and not this year, the year before, we always do one about the music from old crime series that have been on the telly. You know, they always had these, this great music, but we didn't just play the music. We had a piper from Stirling who played it on the bagpipes. And you try to figure out the music from yeah, crime series, <laughs> and it, it's a little bit harder, but, but it was very entertaining. It, to be fair, that we're not going to run that one again. <laughs> on the basis that it was a lot tougher than anyone thought, even to identify Z cars, and I could even whistle Z cars. <laughs> but there's one reason why we would say Bloody Scotland's successful, and I would say that one reason that crime writing is successful in Scotland is it is built on inclusivity, it's not built on exclusivity. The, to, to many of the readers out there, the authors that we have are the rock stars, but they don't behave like that. When you go to events and you'll all have done it, the, auth the authors that we deal with do not come out of their tent five minutes before they're due and then disappear in the limo afterwards. They're as happy to sit down and sign books, talk to you and go for a pint. And that's important because for us, you have to, under you have to understand how hard that is for a lot of authors to do. It wasn't that long ago that authors just had to sit in a room and write. And that was it. Now you're expected to, to appear on events, you're expected to speak. Some do stand-up comedy, some even appear in question time. And therefore, what we've found is, and one of the lessons was, taking that humour, but that dark humour that works for Scottish writing, if you take it and transfer it across into bloody Scotland, we, we are trying to be as informal as possible. I, I, this is just a fact for us. We pay the same whether it's Ian Rankin or a debut author to appear at Bloody Scotland. There is no different fees. We don't pay Noel Edmonds 600,000 to appear and then someone else 10. Everybody gets paid the same. And you'd be amazed how many don't even take the fee of the authors. They, 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 they leave it overall. We do a thing called Crime of the Coup, which is running a Saturday night where the authors get to do something that isn't what they do. So you'll find them down there playing guitars, playing mouth organs, singing. Last year, Ragnar Johansson uh, from Iceland did an entire poem in Icelandic to the audience. No one had a clue what he was saying, but got a massive round of applause at the end of it. <laughs> what people are trying to do is they want to meet their heroes, but what they want to understand is the process of writing. They're interested in why people write and how they write. And we've no desire to turn this into some cold monument of crime. Scottish crime writing can't do that. From our point of view, it's about warmth, it's about connection. It's about reader and writer getting closer and closer together. It's not about separation. That's why you find people kicking a ball in the oldest bowling green in, in, uh, in, in Scotland. That's why you'll find them playing a guitar. That's why you'll find them reading. Interaction for us is the norm. So what we wanted to do was, to, just to sum this up, was what lessons do we think we could take from what we've done at Bloody Scotland and what Scottish crime writing's done? Are there any lessons for people that are out there that are thinking about how to move forward in any sphere? So we've kind of looked at it from that point of view. Um, so there's a phrase I like, a rising tide lifts all boats. And to my mind, that is what Bloody Scotland was set out to do Success breeds success. Um, Scotland has become better known. Uh, we always had the writers, it's just people hadn't heard about them. Uh, so with Ian Val and the others blazing a path after Willie McIlvanny, uh, they'd learned from him. More people think, well, could I do that? And that's very important to us. We feel the same about Bloody Scotland. Um, and every year we want to meet more people, encourage more people to come. And as each year becomes more successful than the last, then our reputation grows. And what's been fascinating, when we're looking for people to come to the festival, we've now got queues of authors just wanting to come to the festival. So we're not going searching for uh, really international stars. They let us know. And the fact that we put it in Sterling has really paid off in this respect because we got, we got a lot of international visitors as well as local visitors. 
So Joe's ne no, Joe Nesbo's a climber, so to get invited to Bloody Scotland is great because then he just goes off and climbs. You get people who think, well, if I go to Stirling, then I could go to the Highlands, and I've never been to Skye. Whereas often when people come up as far as Edinburgh or Glasgow, that's the end of their journey, uh, which is why we wanted to have it to in a place that had the Highlands right on the doorstep as well. We couldn't have done it without the support of the major authors to begin with, as I mentioned earlier on. They allowed us to start the ball rolling and, and let others get their chance. I think the other thing is what we've learned is there is no process. If you talk to any writer at all, every writer writes differently. There is no process out there. The reason I put that chart up is I was reading a, an article recently about a coach who works with primary school children in Chicago, and she'd been working with them for years, and that's how she said you write. Yeah? You do the pre-write, you do the draft, you do the revision, you do the edit, and you publish it. It's that easy. Until she became a writer, and then she changed her mind. <laughs> and the lesson for us when we're putting on something like Bloody Scotland or writing a book is, that, the, on the right-hand side there, there is no magical formula, there is no way of doing it. There, you have to go out there and try. And one of the things and one of the reasons we think Scottish crime fiction has been so successful is we have so many authors out there now trying to write, so many authors trying different voices, different, different places, looking in different ways at how they can bring it to the masses. Yeah, and, and you see that very dramatically at our Pitch Perfect event. Just to give you a little example, Pitch Perfect event, not this year, the year before, um, you, you submit, a, for those prospective writers out there, you submit 100 words by email about a book that you may not have written it yet, but your little pitch for a book, okay, a crime novel. And then if, you, if we like it, we select, we get a lot of entries, we select six. Um, the book may not have been written yet, and the, the one, the story I'm going to tell you, the book wasn't written yet. And she came and, and pitched it at Bloody Scotland and won. And that book is called The Tattoo Thief. Uh, and it's now, it's published all around the world. And in fact, in seven years of Bloody Scotland, we've had seven new authors published from Pitch Perfect. So success does breed success. The talent was out there, we just hadn't, we hadn't found it yet. So the other thing is be bold. There's no point in being innovative if you're not bold with it. Having a great idea, but doing absolutely nothing with it. When we set up Bloody Scotland, we had no idea what we were doing. Uh, I asked Gordon, we were going to have a, a meeting, we actually about it, about this idea, and we met in Princess Square. I think I had about three pots of tea. Mm. And I remember, I mean, Gordon has done a lot of work in, in the area of promotion of festivals, out, not like this, but... Um, I said, do you want to, do you fancy having a go at this with us? And, and he said, <laughs> he said oh, how hard can it be to set up a book festival? <laughs> That's why I that love. That came home to haunt me big time, <laughs> that did. Um, we chose to shoot for the moon in year one. Instead of creating that festival, if you take Harrogate is the biggest one south of the border. Has anybody ever been to Harrogate? It's a fabulous festival but it takes place at the Old Swan Hotel and it's got one big room that holds 700 people. So basically it's just got one venue and it's just back to back. Now that's a whole lot easier than the bold us decided we were going to have three events simultaneously over the whole weekend. That's quite tricky, but of course, we didn't really realise that. But we just thought it was a good idea at the time. Uh, so definitely, but I think that was what made us different because we knew we have a remit and the remit of Bloody Scotland was to do those three things. And we had to have three events running simultaneously in order to do that. 
And the other thing we would say is our lesson is be inclusive, not exclusive. I've spent 35 years of my life in marketing, right? And I've spent my life trying to understand the target audience. And I've never been in a place like literary world where you can apply it in such, such a kind of specific way. It's a blanket. We've got so many genres out there that cover so many different areas. It'd be easy for us to run the same festival each year. It'd be easy for Lynn to write a similar book to the one she did before. It'd be easy for someone to copy someone else that's out there. But that's the way to a slow death. If you do that, eventually people will just get bored with what you're doing. Reinvention on a regular basis means listening to what everybody's saying out there. We need to seek out the new. We, we put events on that maybe only 12 people will turn up at, but seeing three years from now, it'll be 700 because we've found someone that we never found before. And that's what we have to keep doing. And if we don't do that, we're going to fall away. It's not going to work from our point of view. So we have to give them the space. And we have to come up with panels we haven't even thought of, events that we want to run. We're trying to think of things that people want to see and people want to read. And all the authors now in Scotland are doing the same thing. They're continually seeking all the time by being inclusive, not exclusive. That's the only way that this works. Yeah, and I suppose the other really important thing uh, is we wanted to be unique. We wanted people to know what Bloody Scotland was and to arrive and find that they had never been at anything like this before. And to achieve that, you're in this innovative process all the time. You want to hang on to the core of what's important, but you want to present it in lots of different ways so that if people have come before, they come back, and there's aspects that are familiar, but there's always something surprising and different about the festival. Um, that's very important. I think the other thing too we've learned above everything, if you really believe, really believe in what you're doing, then you can convince others and they will support you. And then what you achieve together is, is amazing. I think so. I know we've maybe slightly over apologies, but in conclusion, from our point of view, I'd like to say thanks to everyone for coming here. But we asked the question at the beginning, what makes Scottish crime rating great? And we actually got a reply from someone that we think sums up exactly why writing and people that write in Scotland is so successful. <laughs> That was a Twitter answer from one, <laughs> one of our players. So thanks very much. And if, I know we're a bit over. Apologies for that. But if there is any questions, sorry, Marshall, I'll hand over to yourself. That's all right. So. You beat me to it. Um, Lynn Anderson and Gordon Brown. Well done. Thanks very much for that tonight. That was fascinating. So um, <clears throat> any questions for our two? We've got one lady over there. How well do you think we've translated from the page to the small screen and to the large screen? Because that is the massive audience and that is really a great way to market our crime um, fiction. And how well have we done and what are the plans to make us do even better in the future? I think it, it, it's an interesting question because there have been notable successes. So if you take Shetland with Anne Cleves in terms of what's happened there, we know from our own perspective that when we put events on with Doogie Henschel and Anne Cleves, we sell out. Yeah? yeah. This year we did The Cry with Helen Fitzgerald. I know Helen's not Scottish, she's from Australia, but we've adopted her as being Scottish. She writes in Scotland. And she lives here. And she lives here. And there are other stuff out there. We think it, we could do better. We, th we think getting the word out, but it's difficult. It's not an easy sell because you're not selling to an audience that necessarily see what we do as being distinct. We are selling to an audience who are looking around the planet. Netflix, mm. you pr Amazon Prime, it's a very different audience out there looking. And, and sometimes they surprise us. So has anyone seen Outlander? The Outlander's amazing. It's, it, 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 the books are great, but the fact that they set shoot in Scotland and everything that goes Everybody. around and taken around the world is sure. brilliant. Yeah. But it's important because if we don't, the next generation are coming up, although the kids read books and they mm. do read books, and, but they also listen to books, but they watch a lot. And if we want to build, we can't just base it on the paper. We mm. have to take it further than that. And one of the things we've been discussing is how do we take the festival and bring that element into it? How, yeah. how do we help expand that? I think we, we do have a bit of an issue if you're thinking about it being made by a UK broadcaster. Um, Scotland is 9% of the population. 
of the UK. If I take a recent quote by uh, Denzel Merrick, uh, who is a, a wonderful crime writer, his books are set over in Argyll. He's a big seller uh, in the shops. Uh, but he's published at the moment by a Scottish, uh, uh, a Scottish publisher, and he was looking to move into the bigger market. But what you get, and I, I've heard this again and again and again, oh, but we've got a Scottish crime writer. Now, when you think about that, how stupid is that? You know, we have got some of the best known international uh, crime series set in Scotland. If you even take the cities alone, have you noticed any crime series set in Scotland and filmed by a major UK? There isn't one at the moment. There's none. Now, writers themselves can't change that. Uh, the, the whole Netflix thing is, is very interesting because I recently was asked to chair, has anybody here seen The Staircase? Uh, it's a, well, if you haven't, you should watch it. It's a, a documentary about uh, an American defence lawyer defending a man who was accused of murdering his wife. It's been a huge success for Netflix and um, it's terribly bad science that, she's, that he's convicted on, which really fascinated me. And the defence lawyer uh, came across to do a number of events here. And just talking about the audience age group, which you mentioned, um, we did two in the O2. They sold out the first one completely, and they did another night, which sold out as well. And we were also at the Queen's Hall. Uh, and I was chairing, and uh, Donald Finlay QC was invited to, to give a Scottish perspective on the defence system that was there. And when the lights showed you the audience, it was all young folk. And they were all intensely interested in the way the law worked. And one of the aspects that Scot uh, Bloody Scotland tries to do, we just don't have uh, literary fi or fiction, crime fiction being discussed in the writers. We always do events that are associated with the law. So the advocates, um, faculty of advocates, does an event as well. And it's not remotely boring, it's absolutely fascinating. And two years ago, we had our now current head of, of Police Scotland, who was, um, he was deputy head at the time, and a senior <coughs> crime scene manager in the Albert Hall, 700 people in there. And the interest of people in the audience about how the police worked, you know, and how things happened. Uh, the desire is there to find out. Uh, and, and putting it on the screen reaches a bigger audience. But you would argue that getting it on something like Netflix, 350 million people watch Netflix. Now, OK, stuff by the... BBC and ITV and everything might eventually get onto Netflix and get that huge audience. But that's an international audience. So I believe Rebus is going to be made again. Um, Ian got the rights back, and but I believe there is some talk. And it should have been done like the Scandies did it, you know, giving time to the story uh, over a longer period. That's a big long answer, sorry. sorry thanks, Lynn. We've got time for one more question, if anybody has any other questions. Nope. Oh, what, hang on one second. Have you got the microphone, John, please? Thank you. Um, when the tickets for next uh, Bloody Scotland goes on sale? <coughs> uh, hang on. <laughs> uh, he says we get to put the site. Uh, they go, we will probably do the launch in June. We usually Excuse do the launch June. in June, but June that we don't know the date on it yet. And as soon as we do the launch, we'll put the stuff up on the website, and the tickets will go on sale then. That's normally. But we, we're having a meeting on Friday. Yeah. We get an next board meeting on Friday, and we'll actually come up with a date, and we'll put it on the website. Uh, and I should say, if you, if you haven't, if you go onto the website at the moment, you can sign up for the newsletter and then you will know in advance of anyone else when they're up there. And if you want a ticket for crime at the queue, it's a bit like trying to get Madonna or whoever's your favourite. Uh, you know, you 
because so there's not that many tickets for Crime it. at the Coup is that thing where the, the authors get to do their own thing at night in the pub. So, like, you'll get famous authors play guitars. Tickets sold out this year in 33 seconds. <laughs> but you're so you have to be really, 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 really quick keen if you want tickets that for that one. Yeah. So is that part two of the talk this evening, then? Are you yeah, we can do it. Well, let's like sing. I can sing that one. Yeah. I can definitely end tonight really, really badly by me singing. <laughs> OK. Ladies and gentlemen, Lynn Anderson and Gordon Brown. Thank you. So thanks once again to our speakers, and also thank you to you, our audience, for participating this evening. If you do want to come along to our next Innovation Nation, then keep your eyes on the website, and uh, they'll be advertised uh, shortly for spring 2019. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you.